It's mass produced by the billion and handled with the care and attention of fine wine. After water, it's the most popular drink on the planet. Quenching the world's thirst for it has raised and wrecked empires. It's a drink of the ancient past and the trendy future. Now, tea on Modern Marvels. It's a delicate leaf renowned for its ability to stimulate and soothe. And yet this little leaf has played a stunningly significant role in the history of the planet. Sparking revolution, precipitating war, and drastically reshaping landscapes across the globe. The human thirst for tea is phenomenal. We drink around one and a half trillion cups of tea a year. And it remains to this day a mystery drink full of paradoxical qualities that are the essence of its appeal. If you're cold, tea will warm you. If you're warm, tea will cool you. If you're excited, it will soothe you. If, if you're lethargic, it will stimulate you. The history of tea and the taste of tea and the vast amount of different types of teas and different manufacturing styles and flavors, aromas, textures, colors, characteristics of tea are such that it speaks to us somehow. And once you're exposed to it, you want to learn more, you want to taste more, you want to experience more. Tea is a major cash crop in dozens of countries around the world, especially in Indonesia, China, India, Kenya, and Argentina. But if you want to find it in North America, you have to come here to the Charleston Tea Plantation on Wadmala Island, South Carolina. This 127-acre tea farm includes a nursery for developing new bushes and an on-site factory that converts freshly picked tea leaf into black tea that is sold throughout the South under the American Classic label. South Carolina and Hawaii are the only places in the U.S. that have the kind of semi-tropical, high rainfall climate needed for growing tea. What tea enjoys is high temperature and high humidity and Charleston is certainly has that during the summer. So really the tea th thrives very well in this location. The Charleston tea plantation has a long and noble history. Tea bushes can live hundreds of years and the thousands of bushes here are all seeded and cloned from Chinese plants that were imported to Charleston over 200 years ago. These plants date back to the first tea plants brought to America back in 1799 by a French botanist by the name of André Mouchot who brought these plants from the Far East. The original bushes were planted about an hour's drive from here, just outside of Charleston. They produced commercial tea until that plantation went out of business in 1915. The Lipton Tea Company bought the bushes, which it continued to grow on their own and replanted cuttings here in 1960 as part of a research and development farm. When Lipton decided to shut the farm down in 1987, the Bigelow Tea Company stepped in. This is a gem. This is a one-of-a-kind thing. And uh, it was just impossible in our minds to see this disappear. The Charleston plantation provides just a fraction of the tea consumed in the U.S. Americans drink 50 billion servings of tea a year, which sounds like a lot, but is itself just a fraction of what the rest of the world drinks. Tea is only the sixth most popular drink in the U.S., after water, coffee, soft drinks, alcohol, and bottled water. As the number two drink worldwide, tea is harvested in gargantuan quantities. Six billion pounds of tea are produced every year, and it takes five pounds of tea raw leaf tea to make one pound of finished tea. That means 30 billion pounds of tea have to be virtually hand-picked throughout the world. Commercial tea is usually farmed on vast plantations, like this one owned by Unilever in Kenya, that stretches over 27,000 acres, employs 24,000 people, and has numerous factories on site. It's also cultivated on thousands of smaller family farms, especially in China, where tea farming began millennia ago. 
and where tea processing as well as farming is still frequently done by hand. There are three major types of tea, black, green, and oolong. But few outside the tea business realize that all three types come from the same plant, Camellia sinensis, which is the only tea plant in the world and is indigenous to China, India, and Thailand. Like wine, there are an estimated 1,500 varietals of tea, with endless varying qualities based on soil and climate. And some are more suited to make one kind of tea over another. But the real differences between black, green, and oolong are created after the leaf has been picked. At the Charleston Plantation, we're going to turn about 5,000 pounds of freshly picked Camellia sinensis into black tea. The first step in making any kind of tea is called withering. The leaves are placed on a withering bed, where they lie for 18 hours. Freshly plucked tea is 80% moisture, and that percentage has to come down to exactly 68%. If the moisture were too low, it would not make a fine quality tea because the enzymes have overbuilt inside the leaf. If they're not withered enough, they haven't built to the sufficient amount to give you that full-bodied flavor when you drink a cup of hot tea or iced tea. Giant fans accelerate the drying process and make sure the leaves wither equally. The fans alternately blow and suck air for an hour at a time through hundreds of holes in the withering bed. Without the fans, the leaves in the middle would turn red and spoil. Traditional tea manufacturing in places like China doesn't require fans because it involves much smaller amounts of tea. After withering, the leaf at Charleston is conveyed to a shredding machine called a rotovane, where the tea will be ripped into pieces small enough to fit into a tea bag. But it's not just a question of size. Shredding is crucial because it tears open the cell walls of the leaf, which allows the tea to oxidize. There are many ways to break open the cell walls, including a number of traditional hand rolling methods still popular in China. The rotovane and other mechanical devices are widely used when working with large amounts of leaf. Inside this rotovane, stationary fingers that we call veins and rotors that go around. And what it's doing is pressing the tea against these veins to rupture that cell wall and expose the tea juices. We want every cell wall broken. We want those juices exposed to the air. These tea juices are what is going to create the oxidation in the leaf to turn it from green leaves into black tea. The shredded leaves come out of the rotovane and onto the oxidation bed. Oxidation is the defining phase in the process of making black or oolong tea. You can see it's a very rich green color. This tea is then going to turn from green to a sort of coppery orange color. This is where the miracle of tea takes place. This is where all the flavor is built. This is where most of the quality comes from. Oxidation is the key to making black, oolong, or green tea. If the tea maker cuts the oxidation time in half, he'd have oolong, a lighter tea that is served in most Chinese restaurants. If he didn't allow any oxidation at all, he'd end up with green tea, the most popular form of tea in Japan, and familiar to anyone who's ever gone to a sushi bar. Oxidation is stopped by steaming the fresh leaves as soon as they've been harvested, as these tea makers from China are doing. Heat neutralizes the enzyme that allows the tea to oxidize and change color. After steaming, green tea goes through the same process of withering, shredding, and drying as black and oolong tea. But today at Charleston, we're making black tea. After exactly 50 minutes, these leaves will produce the kind of light, bright tea that's favored in the U.S. This is the oxidation that we're looking for. This sort of coppery, orangey color inside the leaf that then goes into the dryer where we're going to take that 68% moisture and reduce it down to just 2%. Leaves are dried to exactly 2% moisture content because anything more would allow the tea to mold later on. The harvested leaf has now been reduced to 20% of its original size and weight. 
That's how five pounds of tea from the field make a single pound of tea. That pound now goes through a series of shaker sieves to remove impurities. A final sieve uses static electricity to pull out tiny bits of fiber. In most countries, these pieces are painstakingly plucked by hand. These plastic rollers are pressed against felt, and underneath that creates a static charge. As the black key goes on along the conveyor, all the stem and fiber is sucked up and taken out of the black tea. And this is what we've taken out of the tea to end up with the pure black tea ready to be packed into tea bags. The process of making tea, which is basically the same around the world, with variations in technology, is simple but exacting. We have a saying in the tea world that tea is made in the field, the quality is produced in the field, and all you can do in the factory is ruin it or maintain that good quality. One can only speculate about the quality of the world's very first cup of tea. According to legend, the mythical Chinese emperor Shen Nung discovered tea in 2737 BC when a couple of leaves fell into his drink. For over 3,000 years, China was the only country in the world that drank tea and its impact on Chinese culture was enormous. To us, tea is more than just a beverage. It inspires poetry and painting and the art of just making tea. Chinese people view us making connection with tea where you're bringing the tea back to life. From the start, tea was perceived as a remarkably healthy drink. Black tea has about 40 milligrams of caffeine per cup, about half as much as a cup of coffee. Its energizing qualities were duly noted, especially by Buddhist monks who used tea to stay alert during meditation. In fact, tea remained a Chinese secret until a monk brought some tea seeds to Japan in the 9th century. Building on Chinese traditions, the Japanese developed elaborate tea ceremonies that eventually became known as Cha Do, the way of tea. Think of tea as Buddhist communion. We are more attuned to what we're paying attention to and less attuned to distraction when we drink tea. So it's a question of wakeful tranquility. And that's exactly what Buddhism is trying to teach. The Portuguese and the Dutch were the first to bring tea to Europe at the beginning of the 17th century. Tea came late to England, but when it did finally arrive in 1664, it took off. King Charles' Portuguese wife, Catherine, had fallen in love with the exotic Chinese drink in Lisbon, and English aristocrats followed her lead. For a long time, aristocrats were the only ones who could afford tea. It was so heavily taxed, 119% in 1706, that it spawned an enormous black market. By the 1770s, half of the tea in England, an estimated seven million pounds a year, was illegal. Bootleg tea was heavily adulterated, filled with twigs and leaves, as well as toxic lead chromate, and even sheep's dung, both of which were used as colorizers. Smuggling ended when Prime Minister William Pitt finally slashed taxes in 1784. Legal tea was now affordable to everyone. But before that happened, there was a little matter involving tea in the American colonies. In late November and early December 1773, three ships loaded with 342 chests of tea reached Boston Harbor. Bostonians, increasingly touchy about the issue of taxation without representation, refused to let the ships unload. On the evening of December 16th, a group of 30 to 60 colonists disguised as Mohawks broke open the chests and dumped the tea in the harbor. The Boston Tea Party pushed relations between the British Crown and the colonies to the boiling point. In less than three years, the Revolutionary War was underway. And tea, which had been highly fashionable and popular throughout the colonies, was suddenly stigmatized. Tea becomes the ultimate symbol of British tyranny. So it becomes the thing that you despise. You have campaigns in the eastern United States to stop drinking tea in the drawing rooms. John Adams asked uh, uh, at a tavern, 
Would it be lawful for a weary traveler to have a cup of tea, provided it has been honestly smuggled? The barmaid said, no, sir. We have renounced tea under this roof. I'll get you a cup of coffee. Across the ocean in England, however, demand for tea continued to soar. To meet demand, the British would build plantations in India, tea plantations that would be modeled on the slave plantations of the American South. The role of tea in the making and breaking of empires is inextricably bound up with one of the world's first and most powerful cartels, the British East India Trading Company. The so-called EIC was founded in 1600 by Queen Elizabeth I, who gave it a royal monopoly on all trade with the Far East. The East India Company would become the backbone of the emerging British Empire, and tea, which eventually accounted for fully a third of its profits, would become the backbone of the EIC. By the start of the 19th century, tea was the third most heavily shipped commodity in the world, behind iron ore and cotton. Britain wasn't the only empire fueled by tea. The Chinese had a global monopoly on selling tea, and they weren't interested in selling it for anything but silver. This led to a trade imbalance with England, known as the Silver Sink, which ultimately paved the way for one of the most shameful chapters in British history. The opium wars are about tea. The opium wars take place because the British start flooding southern China with Indian opium, selling opium to local people in southern China to pay for the trade imbalance around the tea trade. And that really becomes the base for the two opium wars. In other words, the British went to war with China twice to force the Chinese to buy British opium so that the British and the East India Trading Company would have silver to pay for their tea. Their entire enterprise rested on uh, a product that went down the drain in Europe, which was purchased with another which went up in smoke in Asia, and that was opium. The trade imbalance with China and the fact that it lost its royal monopoly on trade with the Orient in 1834 prompted the East India Company and others to try to cultivate tea outside of China. An indigenous tea plant had been found in the Assam region of India in 1820. And in India, the East India Trading Company could do as it pleased. They could try you and execute you for violation of their own laws. Uh, uh, they had uh, standing armies. They had a navy, which was larger than the British Royal Navy. So if you're talking about power, it's a power that's rarely been equaled. This was their colony. Therefore, they could move into areas and say, this is wasteland, we're going to bring these people into work, and that's it, it's a done deal, because it's theirs. With brutal haste, the British hacked an infrastructure through jungles and forests, created massive plantations, and imported tens of thousands of workers to labor in the fields. These are systems of production and models of production that have been used in the United States and the Caribbean for 200 years, the slave plantation system. There's a big house, there is um, hundreds if not thousands of people who are harnessed to work on these systems with a very little if not any pay. They are brought in from other places to do the work and they become a trapped, indentured labor force. Plantation owners even used laws from antebellum slavery in the U.S. to keep its tea workers in line. If you as a worker tried to escape, you were tracked down like a fugitive. And the Fugitive Slave Law of America, um, which was used here in slave plantations, was actually applied by the British in, uh, in tea country. The disconnect in England about what was happening in India around tea was profound. 70% of the plantation workforce was female and romanticized images of exotic women with nimble fingers became a staple of tea marketing that continues to this day. Meanwhile, afternoon tea, introduced by the Duchess of Bedford in 1840 to stave off hunger pains, became a national passion. Tea produced by virtual slaves, many of whom died under savage conditions in the field, now emerged as Britain's quintessential symbol of civility. 
By 1855, Assam was exporting over 500,000 pounds of tea. The number shot up to 86 million pounds within 30 years, with British imports surpassing those from China in 1888. Along the way, the economy and the landscape of much of the subcontinent was stunningly altered. Vast and uniform new tea fields were engineered to make it as easy as possible to harvest tea. You see miles and miles and miles of the same height of tea bushes. It looks like a bonsai forest. And the kind of technical attention and focus during labor of keeping those bushes absolutely even is extraordinary. When you're looking at it from afar, it's like an optical illusion. And you think actually that it is like um, a, a green carpet, you know, that just stretches out. The geometric tea fields reflected a new regime of industrialized tea production. Every plantation had its own factory to process the massive harvests of raw leaf. The result was a fundamental shift from the Chinese model of tea manufacturing, which featured small-scale production of many different kinds of tea. To make things as efficient as possible, the British decided to produce primarily black tea. British Empire tea, which would be produced on similar plantations in Ceylon, Kenya, and other colonies, became synonymous with black tea. And black tea outside of Japan and China became synonymous with tea. It would take more than a century for the hundreds of varieties of handcrafted Chinese teas to once again find their way into the West. In the meantime, mass-produced teas would generate new forms and new technologies. The tea bag didn't arrive until the 20th century, but it quickly established itself as one of the iconic everyday objects of modern life. Especially in the United States, where 65% of all tea, both iced and hot, is brewed through the bag. The Lipton Tea Company alone makes some 9 billion tea bags a year just in the U.S. 90% of them here, in Lipton's blending and tea bagging plant in Suffolk, Virginia. Our Suffolk facility is one of the largest, if not the largest, tea bag facility in the world. And if you can imagine, about 15 or 20 40-foot ocean-going containers full of tea going through that plant each week, that's the kind of volumes that we put through this facility. Long rows of these frenetic machines punch out a million tea bags an hour, 24 million a day, seven days a week. The machines make around 200 bags a minute and use an astonishing 2,500 moving parts to whip together the simple pouches. It looks like an expensive clock that has all these moving parts and you're standing there and you're watching it and it's just fascinating to see all this stop and go movement in the creation of a tea bag. Lipton tea bagging components, paper, label, string and staples, fly through the machine with amazing precision and speed. The sides of the bags are not glued together, but folded so neatly that they hold their shape when steeped in boiling water. The center fold is very important because if it's not a tight fold, the tea is going to come out into the cup, and that's something we do not want. Tea bags were an accidental revolution. An American tea seller sent out samples of tea in silk pouches in 1908. Instead of taking the tea out and brewing it loose leaf style, buyers just dropped the pouches in hot water, and the tea bag was born. Eventually, the silk became gauze, and then paper. Commercial production in the 1920s added the string and tag. A big breakthrough in tea bagging technology came in the 1950s when the tea bagging machines that Lipton still uses were first introduced. The machines were designed to create Lipton's signature double sided or flow through bag. If you put two tea bags together, you'd get more tea flavor. Well, that's the idea behind our Lipton flow through bag. 
and Lipton converted their entire operation to manufacturing that bag and it vaulted Lipton by far to the number one position in the marketplace. And the advantage of this tea bag was that you actually created four sides for the tea to be exposed to water and it created more space in the tea bag for the leaves to expand and to brew properly. Lipton's newest generation of tea bagging machines is three times as fast as the older models. This one, which shoots out 600 bags a minute, is used to bag Lipton's green and specialty teas. The technology, meanwhile, is racing to keep up with the changes in the traditional tea bag, like this single serve stick from the Serengeti Tea Company in Los Angeles and roomier pyramid bags that can hold larger pieces of leaf. Shooting tea into small pouches is the culmination of a long process for mass market tea manufacturers like Lipton. Tea tasting is at the heart of that process. Yep, that's okay. Because that's because most Lipton teas are actually blends made up of dozens of individual teas. Making sure those blends have consistent flavor, color, and mouthfeel requires constant changes in the formula and constant tasting. The reason we have to keep tasting to maintain that taste is every tea garden can make a different type of tea every week. The quality of their teas can change according to weather, according to how well they pluck the leaf and how well it was rolled. So it's almost like a juggling act. You know, you're constantly changing the formulas to keep consistency. Lipton's classic orange peco tea is made up of between 40 and 60 teas. Lipton has devised a numerical code from 1 to 7 then we'll call it a 4.2 on that. that it uses to describe the attributes of teas. So for our mainstream blend, we try and keep around a taste score of, you know, say 4.4. We try and keep a very high color or hue score of maybe 6.8. And we'd probably try and keep a medium mouthfeel or thickness score of around 4.8. It's fairly thick, so about a 5.2. Tea tasting is a skill that requires four to five years of intense training. John Cheatham served his apprenticeship in Sri Lanka, where he tasted as many as 1,200 teas a day. It's a bit like learning to play a musical instrument. The more you practice, the better you get at it. And the more you practice, the more you're better to pick out different types of tastes. And in the end, you're able to pick out the best teas that will fit in the Lipton blends. When we're tasting, we suck in the tea at around 100 miles per hour, and that's so you can oxidize the tea and break it up into particles, and also spray it around to different parts of your mouth, because you're tasting different things with different parts of your mouth. Lipton's ever-changing blend sheets are programmed at company headquarters in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, and then downloaded into the computerized blending system at Suffolk. Vast quantities of tea from around the world are processed here every day, vigorously sifted to remove impurities, and then funneled into massive silos. A typical silo here will hold about 10,000 pounds, and we'll go through that in a 24-hour period, and we have multiple silos on site. Some silos hold just a single tea, while others hold a pre-blend of three to four teas. The silos themselves initiate Lipton's blending process by swirling the teas together as they fall through the conical end. Conveyor belts carry the teas from the silos to this blending machine, which gently tumbles the day's recipe. The blends are then conveyed to 2,000 pound super sacks that feed the tea bagging machines. Not all the tea in America is processed into tea bags. About one-sixth of it is converted into powder, which is used to make instant tea, and also is part of fountain and bottled tea blends. Lipton and other major manufacturers produce and sell $400 million worth of tea powder each year. 
The powder is made in processing plants that brew tea in a large vat, then pump it up and spray it into the top of a tower that can rise up 100 feet or more. High temperatures in the upper part of the tower instantly vaporize the water in the tea, leaving a tea residue, which crystallizes as it descends in the cooler air. Tea powder and tea bags are frowned upon in much of the world, including China and India, where many people still drink tea loose leaf style. Traditional drinkers insist that the directly infused leaf puts more flavor in the brew. But sometimes you can have too much of a good thing. Welcome to Celestial Seasonings and the overwhelming power of peppermint. Every year, Celestial Seasonings uses half a million pounds of freshly picked peppermint and spearmint in its popular herb tea blends. This is where it's stored, in the mint room at the company warehouse and factory in Boulder, Colorado. The mint room is very intense. Uh, it'll go to your sinuses, your nose will start dripping, and your eyes will start watering. Some people can just stick their head in, and then they have to leave. And in fact, a very popular t-shirt we have for sale is, I survived the mint room. We had to double seal the walls and the ceilings of this because the oil was so high that it would leak through and contaminate the rest of the herbs, so everything would be tasting like mint. Mint is just one of over a hundred herbs that Celestial Seasoning stocks in mega quantities for its various blends. A dog might go insane wandering these warehouse aisles, stuffed with everything from cinnamon to ginger to vanilla bean to licorice to lemongrass. The herb tea giant revolutionized the American tea industry in the 1970s with the introduction of feel-good botanical blends like Sleepy Time and Red Zinger. Many of the blends were made entirely of herbs. They didn't contain Camellia sinensis, or tea. And they introduced consumers to a medicine chest of plants that could reputedly do everything from prevent a cold and soothe a sore throat, to fire up your sex drive and settle your nerves. Hibiscus, the herb that puts the zing in red zinger, is imported mainly from Thailand and China. Celestial Seasonings uses one million pounds of it a year. Before it can be blended with other ingredients, the raw compacted hibiscus, like all the other herbs that Celestial uses, has to be broken down into pieces that will fit into a tea bag. The first phase of milling is done by hand. What that individual is doing is breaking it down into consumable units, if you will, so that it doesn't back up within the internal mechanisms of the machine. That individual is also doing a visual inspection of the ingredients, so any foreign material that would be present in the ingredient before it go through our process, we're pulling that out. The herb is further broken down into smaller but still coarse pieces, and then conveyed to a cutter mill, where the real chopping is done. Here, the hibiscus falls onto a shaft embedded with seven three-inch high and one-inch thick blades that rotate at high speed. The shredded hibiscus is then sucked through the system into a gyrating sifter that holds ten screens, each one with a finer mesh than the one before. We want it to be real consistent because if we have large particles and smaller particles, the infusion rate's going to be different for all of those particles. After milling, the herbs are blended and then funneled to Celestial's tea bagging machines. Because these tea bags don't have strings or tags or staples, these machines are a lot faster than those at Lipton, flinging out upwards of a thousand tea bags a minute. It's a pretty intricate web that goes through the machine that will seal the two sides of the tea bag paper that actually has adhesive together. The sealing temperature is quite high, upwards of about 150 degrees centigrade. And so that's important to us because a consumer is putting boiling water on top of a tea bag at 100 degrees centigrade. We want to make sure that that bond is going to stay intact throughout that entire cup of tea. Celestial Seasonings pioneered the herb or hippie tea revolution in the United States in the late 1960s. The first herbs were picked in the wild from fields and meadows around Boulder. 
Weeds for Needs was one of the company's early slogans. They wildcrafted it right here in the Rocky Mountains, and then they had to uh, figure a way to dry it and a place to dry it in so it wouldn't be rained on. So they used somebody's barn and another person's garage. And then they stuffed it into muslin bags by hand and uh, put little strings around it and then took it to natural food stores. Early reaction from the tea industry, which revolved almost entirely around traditional black tea, was dismissive. I remember going to a tea company in the south of London, England, and their manufacturing manager allowed me to tour their whole facility saying, you're no competition to us. And uh, I think they, they think a little differently now. Indeed, herbal and flavored teas now account for over a third of tea bag and loose leaf sales in America. Celestial Seasonings alone sells over $100 million worth of blends a year, most of them entirely herbal. But one botanical with great taste and remarkable medicinal value remains the original Camellia sinensis, or tea. It's been valued as a healthy potion for millennia, and new research indicates that it might turn out to be a pharmacological treasure trove of health benefits and cures, which may explain why tea is finally giving its old rival coffee a run for the money put down that cup of coffee it's time to spill the beans and it's time to pick up a cup of good health one cup of tea at a time that's the mantra in trendy tea places like the botanical herb and tea garden in beverly hills tea consumption doubled in the u.s between 2001 and 2006 and more and more people are making tea their drink of choice that's largely because of the reputed health benefits of tea. Research suggests that tea plays a role in the prevention of obesity, osteoporosis, gum disease, and heart disease. Especially green tea, which was nearly impossible to find in the U.S. 10 years ago, and now accounts for 19% of the market. Green tea is packed with antioxidants that many researchers say prevent cell damage and slow down the aging process. But the number one antioxidant in green tea, a single molecule called EGCG, or epigallocatechin gallate, may have other beneficial properties. We were exploring chemicals that had been derived from Chinese herbal medicine and asking whether any of these chemicals could attack cancer-causing proteins. And uh, sure enough, uh, for one of the cancer targets that we were very interested in, we found this uh, chemical from green tea that binds very tightly to this cancer protein and inhibits its activity. EGCG, which makes up about 70% of the dry weight of tea, neutralizes BCL-XL, otherwise known as the anti-death protein, a gene that doesn't allow cancer cells to die. The anti-death genes become hyperactive, and this allows the cancer cell to expand, to increase its numbers, because they, they've forgotten how to die. The same mechanism explains why it's often very difficult to kill cancer cells, even with the best weapons we have, such as chemotherapy and radiation. Researchers used nuclear magnetic resonance, an advanced version of medicine's MRI, to get a picture of how a single molecule of EGCG interacts with a single molecule of the anti-death protein family. Dr. Maurizio Palecchia was in charge of the research. This is the protein that when overexpressed in cancer cells prevent them from dying and allow them to proliferate. In red here we have this small molecule. This is epigallocatechin gallate, which even being very small compared with the protein, is able to insert itself on this deep crevice on the surface of the molecule and block its activity. Conclusive research on the cancer-killing benefits of green tea remains to be done. And it's unclear how much EGCG is actually in the kind of processed green teas on sale in most stores. Still, Dr. Reed is convinced that a little green tea every day can't hurt. You've got antioxidants, you've got the detoxifying effect of the chemicals revving up our own detoxifying systems, and then you've got the direct effect against cancer-causing proteins. So, why not take a chance? <laughs> which is exactly what people are doing at places like Dr. T's Herb and Tea Garden. There are over a hundred varieties of tea here, green as well as black, oolong, and herb, 
most of them imported from India and China in small batches. Unlike mass-produced teas, which aim for consistency, the very inconsistency of these teas, the fact that they vary from harvest to harvest depending on climate, soil, and even the style of plucking, is what makes them intriguing to devotees. And pricey. Dr. T's menu ranges from $4 to $300 a pot. This tea, called Tai Ping from the Fujian province of southern China, was once reserved for Chinese royalty and was served to Richard Nixon during his historic visit to China in 1972. This plantation produces, it's in its entire year, 150 kilos, 300 pounds of tea, and that's it. I was given 14 ounces. One of my most prized teas right here. Dr. T's most prized tea, however, is this one. It's Pu'er, a category of Chinese tea that, like wine, improves with age. That's because of a processing method that's been a Chinese state secret since the 14th century, which enables the leaf to develop a mold as it ages. And that mold protects the tea and ripens the flavor. You can see here how the blue is that little bacteria that grows on the tea cake. And it's that bacteria combined with the chemical pH balance of the tea that provides this tea cake with the most delicate nose, the most delicate palate of sweetness that you have never experienced. Oh my. Who wears have sold at auction for as much as $40,000 per cake. Dr. T's 1952 Pu'er sells for nearly $1,000 an ounce. But tea aficionados may not entirely feel the pain, because tea, according to Dr. T, is the only plant on Earth that has a stimulant, caffeine, and a tranquilizer, something called L-theanine. That makes the tea buzz totally different from that of coffee. The caffeine stimulates the beta brain waves, the fright-flight response. Your body goes into a state of shock with caffeine. It's ready to take care of it, a perilous situation. L-theanine secreted into the brain stimulates the alpha brain waves. Relaxed, focused, meditative energy. Tea has it, coffee does not. No pleasure is simpler, no luxury cheaper, and no consciousness altering substance more benign than our simple tea. You want to be ceremonious about tea making, there's certainly tea for you. You want something to quench your thirst, there's tea for you. You want something to keep you up working, there's tea for you. There's nothing else on earth like it. Which may explain why the 5,000 year old drink of emperors has become the preferred drink of humankind. Not only does tea have a unique ability to wake up and calm, like wine, the best teas have an extraordinary range and subtlety of tastes. Whether tea time represents a moment of tranquility in the stampede of life, or an inexpensive Epicurean thrill, the human thirst for this benign and inscrutable drink promises to deepen for millennia to come. <laughs>